So there's widespread support for the AFS goal of lifting the value of Australian agricultural production to 100 million uh, by 2030. While this goal may be achievable, we should be mindful of the substantial and sometimes painful uh, reforms that have underpinned the growth that got us to where we are today. Uh, and that favourable global prices uh, account for 90% of past trend growth. Furthermore, the rate of productivity growth has been slowing in the last few years. Key reasons include, include adverse shifts in climate and seasonal conditions, a reduced investment efforts at, in proportion or in relation to the value of output, and that the most important productivity enhancing reforms have already been implemented. This suggests nothing can be taken for granted. Instead, we should recognise that achieving the best outcomes for agriculture, our rural communities and the national economy will require some tough choices. I'm going to illustrate five of those sort of areas where tough choices and, and staying the course will be required, um, but they're not the only tough choices around. It's also relevant for the sector that, uh, you know, in a bad year, with, with lower current value of output, when you project forward, it's harder to get uh, to where we want to be. So, so last year, when we were doing these projections, uh, the top line, uh, which assumes uh, we continue our favourable price trend, uh, was over 90 billion rather than uh, 88, uh, and the bottom line was a little bit better as well. Um, So the first area of tough choice is ensuring agriculture is attractive for both workers and investors. The sector is well aware of the need to attract workers with the right mix of skills and is already taking some steps to address this. The 2018 budget also provided funds to improve the evidence base uh, and understanding of labour force issues and su the supply uh, and demand of agricultural labour. It's encouraging to see sectors acknowledging the see sector leaders acknowledging the need to eliminate exploitation of workers, particularly seasonal workers and other vulnerable groups, but actions are always going to speak louder than words when we're trying to ensure a positive experience for farm workers. On the investment side, investment from all sources, foreign and domestic, has a crucial role in lifting productivity uh, and strengthening supply chains. Unfortunately, agriculture faces some headwinds in attracting investment, and it's best to be clear-eyed about that. Those headwinds include high seasonal variability relative to other nations that Australia just can't do much about, but also some persistent policy uncertainty across a range of areas. This makes it crucial that Australia's foreign investment rules are applied transparently and predictably so that we respect understandable community caution that we want to ensure as a country that investment is always delivering social and economic benefits to the nation, while we maintain Australia's reputation as a stable and attractive investment destination. The second tough choice ahead of us uh, is how we harness innovation to boost performance. So Australia is not immune to global shifts in research and development and extension. These trends include slower growth in public investment, which in the past has provided the foundation for more applied private R&D. As the Minister said, our distinctive use of government funded or government and levy funded um, uh, RDCs has served us well in the past, but needs some adjustment to ensure that the available resources deliver the best possible outcomes for agriculture and the nation as a whole. Priorities include reducing fragmentation and improving collaboration on whole of sector challenges, achieving greater clarity and consistency around contributions and benefit sharing, so who pays and who benefits, and also achieving faster adoption and commercialisation of the successful research. Now, these issues are going to be discussed in much more depth at two o'clock today in the Bradman Room, with speakers including uh, Andrew Metcalf from EY um, talking about the report that the Minister was just 
telling you about. The third tough choice or challenge area is how to promote on-farm resilience and risk management. Now, everyone in this room knows that Australian farmers manage very significant variability, including variable climate and volatile commodity prices. We also know that climate variability is increasing and extreme events such as drought and floods are becoming more frequent and severe, impacting on agricultural output and incomes. Globally, this volatility occurring elsewhere in the world is likely to contribute to more volatile commodity prices here at home. It's a good bet in these circumstances that future droughts and weather events will continue to trigger calls for government to do more to help farmers. But policymakers should continue to be careful in how they respond to such calls, as poorly designed policies have the potential to slow farm adaptation and structural adjustment, harming industry productivity growth. For this reason, it's crucial to ensure policy assistance does not harm the long-term productivity and competitiveness of the sector. Australia's national drought policy rightly establishes a clear separation between promoting proper risk management on farm by farm businesses versus and separate from providing support to farm households and communities in need. Under these policies, agriculture receives significant government support, largely through tax concessions, which as the, you can see in front of you, account for about 90% of Commonwealth uh, risk-related assistance. Um, but also through, uh, sorry, largely through tax concessions such as the farm management deposit schemes, the, the largest spike on the top, um, <clears throat> but also through welfare programs such as farm household allowance. Eligibility criteria for the farm household allowance are more generous than those apply uh, to income support uh, available to other groups in our national community. ABEAR's views, in my view, is that these programs provide important relief for farm households consistent with Australian community values. Overall, current settings are unlikely to undermine the resilience and drought preparedness or to have substantial adverse impacts on uh, agricultural productivity growth. This is a policy achievement worth defending. It's been hard work to get here. It's worth defending against well-meaning or occasionally self-interested calls to blur the lines between household support and business assistance. But as the Minister was just saying on another topic, we should always seek further improvements. Here, remaining policies that provide business assistance, such as concessional finance, need to be carefully assessed. Over time, the perceived need for policies such as that, providing business assistance, could be reduced by further development and uptake of market-based risk management tools, such as multi-peril crop insurance, or if it becomes viable, index-based insurance for both cropping and livestock operations. Tomorrow's closing session for the conference will see five speakers giving their frank and fearless views, I'll be one of them, uh, on managing drought and risk uh, in a changing, changing climate. We invite you to hang around and join that conversation. The reason that this is so important is that it's well known that productivity growth is, is really tightly tied uh, with the adjustment uh, of the sector and the, uh, the increase in the size of farms. So 20% of farms account for 60% of output. They manage a lot of land, um, but they're substantially more productive uh, than the rest of the sector. Uh, if, if all farms were as productive as the top 20%, uh, our output would be about one quarter high, 25% higher. The fourth area for tough choices is persisting with water reforms. So going back to basics, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was inspired in part by the 2003 Living Murray Initiative and its vision of a healthy working river. Not a wilderness river, not a pristine river, but a healthy working river. It was also a reaction to the realities graphically exposed by the millennium drought, which happened around that time. This vision was predicated on the shared convictions that healthy communities and regional economies 
required a healthy working river. And achieving this healthy working river, river required substantial changes to water management. These changes were twofold, promoting water trading across the basin, which allows water to move to highest value use, and altering the balance between then consumptive environmental uses to achieve healthy river ecosystems. This view that healthy industries require healthy catchments has not always been visible in recent debate and finger pointing, which is too often framed in terms of trade-offs between industry or development versus the environment, as if these things were just existed in separate universes. It's self-evident that achieving the NFF aspirations for agriculture as a whole requires sustainable management of Australia's scarce water resources. Irrigated crops are one of the strongest growing agricultural sectors with excellent future prospects. And there's lots of, there's a deep backstory behind that and why that's happening. Realising the full potential of the irrigation sector will require clarity and confidence in water policy settings including confidence that those water policy settings are supporting the sector's social licence. And we need to avoid the uncertainties associated with acrimonious ongoing debate. To be blunt, advocates seeking more water for irrigation and less water for the environment need to think carefully about the risk that they might win the battle and lose the war. The fifth and final challenge relates to respecting and responding to evolving community and consumer expectations. Staying ahead of the curve on consumer expectations sits at the heart of agriculture's value proposition, reputation and future growth. As a bureaucrat, I can tell you this can only be led effectively by industry. Shifts in social expectations might may well be both the greatest opportunity and the greatest threat facing Australian agriculture. Rising real incomes allow consumers and citizens to care about issues they have previously ignored or downplayed. And to express this care, both through their purchasing decisions and through their networks. These issues might be personal, such as health, or more general, such as concerns to the environment or animal welfare. Shifts in consumer sentiment can occur rapidly and they're very difficult to predict. In 2016, for example, around 15% of milk consumers voted unexpectedly with their wallets, shifting from cut price a dollar a litre milk to more expensive branded milk, which delivered an estimated additional $100 million in sales revenue, prompted by con general concerns about the plight of dairy farmers. But capitalising on consumer expectations over the long term involves risks and hard work. Back in 2003, Perth-based Austral Fisheries caused some waves when it set out to secure independent Marine Stewardship Council sustainability certification for Patagonian toothfish as a first step in a sophisticated customer engagement strategy. And boy, did they get some flack from others in the industry. But their persistence paid off. Today, more than half the global catch is certified. The premium, the premium market position of the fish has now been restored and prices have increased around 300%. But some shifts will involve more threats than opportunities, at least in the absence of stronger engagement by industry. Producers are particularly exposed on environmental and animal welfare issues where real or perceived poor behaviour by a few players can tarnish the reputation of an entire sector. Assessing these risks and opportunities requires the industry to understand how consumers think and feel, even when this is confronting. As an example, debates about land clearing can be polarising, typically generating more heat than light. To be hard-nosed about this, however, it's in the industry's interest to consider how the economic rewards of land clearing for some graziers, 
stack up against the potential risk to the reputation, social licence and market position of the industry nationally and to think also about the various ways these risks can be managed. I'm sure everyone in the room can identify other risks and opportunities that would benefit from this sort of hard-nosed consideration. So focusing on the main game, Australia's agriculture has many advantages and a track record of good performance underpinned by past tough choices. The theme of this year's Outlook Conference is that we have more tough choices ahead of us, as well as behind us. Examples of these tough choices and areas where clear thinking and a focus on the long game are woven through the whole program with the dedicated session on this topic tomorrow morning in this theatre. Now, ABES hasn't chosen this theme out of fear. We are impressed by the past performance of Australian agriculture and confident in its future but we also are clear-eyed and we respect the hard work that has underpinned what the sector has achieved in the past. If Australia continues to innovate and adapt as it has in the past, the sector will prosper, enhancing the well-being of producers, consumers, regions and the nation. Welcome to the conference. I look forward to lots of vigorous discussion. Thank you very much.